my presentation and my pointer as well? Yes. I, my, my, I mean, my cursor? Yes, yes. OK, perfect. perfect. OK, I will give you a five minutes warning. Just uh, this. So uh, the stage is yours. So you can start. Thank you. OK, th thanks very much. Thanks very much for the invitation. It, it's a great pleasure to, to give this talk uh, in your meeting. I should start with a disclaimer that I'm coming from uh, three back-to-back -back administrative meetings, one of which lasted five hours. So, uh, so I haven't managed to to to, to follow this uh, this morning uh, this morning's talks. I'm going to assume that uh, people have already talked to you about the promise of gravitational wave astronomy and uh, and you know the wonderful things that we're going to get from gravitational waves at the Event Horizon Telescope and this other strong gravity observations. Um, and in, in this uh, context, exactly, I want to ask, uh, I, I want to pose the following question. We're going we're gonna to have uh, all of this new data coming from the strong gravity regime. At the same time, we have already observations that uh, constrain uh, uh, deviations from, from general relativity or potentially the standard model in the weak gravity regime. Uh, so I, I think it's interesting to ask what kind of classical theory of gravity could describe new physics in the strong gravity in the strong field regime while being consistent with the other observations we have. Uh, so there, there is perhaps one of the most exciting uh, outcomes of observing black holes and neutron stars uh, more closely could be to uncover this, this new fundamental uh, physics. And I'm assuming I'm, I'm using the term classical gravity theory here because you know, even though there are obviously uh, other suggestions as well, it is probably more likely than not that the large astrophysical objects that we see are actually well described by classical physics. The reason I, I, I find this question interesting is uh, because, first of all, it helps us uh, understand how likely or theoretically plausible, if you, if you, if you want, is it to see such deviations. To, to study them in a, in a context of a classical uh, gravity theory other than general relativity. Uh, so in a sense, this, this uh, alternative theories uh, uh, work as proxies between more fundamental theories and, 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 and observations. Uh, at the same time, and Astrid already mentioned that in, in, in her talk, uh, it is interesting to have theories rather than just parameterizations so in many cases, we can parameterize deviations from general relativity in, in, uh, in a theory agnostic way. And this is very, very helpful. Uh, but we can't do that always. The, 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 the uh, very nonlinear merger of two black holes uh, is, is one such example. Even if we do parameterize uh, deviations, there is usually no no real meaning in, in, in the quantities that come into this parameterization. So you still need to interpret them in, in, terms, of the, in terms of a theory. And uh, so the other, the other advantage of, of considering um, the theories I'm, I'm, I'm talking about is because they do help, they do for, give you an alternative way, in a sense, to parameterize deviations from TR that is meaningful in terms of field theory. Uh, and at the same time, they give you a way to uh, quantify deviations and model deviations beyond general relativity and the standard model. Now, the question, the way I posed it originally, what kind of classical gravity theory would describe new physics in the strong field regime while being consistent with other observations is, is clearly very, you know, extremely open-ended and very, very hard to answer. It only acquires some, some uh, precise meaning if you define a field content and then it becomes a consistent field theory question. So, and indeed, what I want to uh, talk about today is um, the, the good progress that people have made in trying to address that question in the specific context of just having one extra scalar field with respect to the metric, right? So, uh, as I said, once you specify the field content, you say, I'm happy to have a metric and one additional scalar field, then it does become a field theory exercise to construct theories that could describe deviations from general relativity or the standard model of particle physics. And, and uh, in, in a sense, it is interesting whether you can uh, use my rationale to put some order in that large um, theory space. So this is what I'm going to focus on 
uh, for the for the rest of the talk. And and in a sense, I'm going to try to to explain to you um, what effect, if any, scalar fields could have on uh, black holes, and how would these black holes then look like? How how would these hairy uh, black holes would look like? So I'm going to start with the simplest possible case of a scalar field. So consider a, a, a scalar field in a in a uh, given background. So it's just just uh, the scalar on a fixed curved background. And assume that it satisfies this equation here, just box phi equals zero, the wave equation in a curved background. Well, uh, it has been showed, so shown um, uh, by several people in, in, uh, and, and eventually by Hawking, the most general kind of a slick proof that if you assume that the that sp uh, background space time is stationary, and asymptotically flat, uh, then the only solution to that equation is phi equals constant. And, and hence, basically, the scalar field is trivial and you can't really detect it. So I mean, stationarity, physically, you can interpret it as the assumption that your system is, is the endpoint of collapse. Um, and asymptotically flatness, of course, reflects that you're talking about an isolated uh, uh, system and you're not taking into account any, any cosmological effects. The, uh, and all that one is assuming on top of that is that there is, uh, in particular, a killing horizon in, in, in this space time. This Noher theorem can also be generalized quite, quite straightforwardly uh, if you allow the scalar field to have self interactions. So, uh, summarized here in terms of a potential. So, and the only additional assumption is that inequality in the bottom of the slide that the second derivative of the potential has to be positive. This uh, condition is actually fa fairly straightforward to interpret. So basically what it tells you is that if you go to a local path and you look at the local effective mass of your scalar, as long as the effective mass square is, is uh, non-negative, uh, is, is positive actually, then, then uh, the, again, the only solution is constant scalar. So, uh, uh, and I'll come back to that condition later on. So, this, this kind of Noher theorems uh, are telling you that this scalar field cannot really leave an imprint in, um, on black holes, uh, on stationary and, as and as asymptotically flat black holes. And here I, I started by considering just the background space time, but now consider having basically some, some uh, modified Einstein's equations where the scalar field participates as well. Just by using the scalar equation, it's just shown that the scalar is constant. Then you plug that back into the other equation, or you're going to get a general relativity plus, plus potentially cosmological constant. Right. So, so basically, that can be used to argue that care will be the most, um, uh, the most general solution that is stationary and asymptotically flat. Now, it can, the result is actually more powerful than it seems in two ways. One is that care, care, uh, uh, black hole solutions are vacuum solutions. So I didn't have to specify anywhere the coupling of the scalar field and the metric to matter, which basically means that I can, I can through, through conformal transformation, the scalar field redefinition. So I can actually generalize quite broadly the class of theories to which these theorems apply. And, and basically, it is the most general action you can write down, which is linear in the first derivatives of the scalar. And, and the, couple, the, the, the scalar is potentially non-minimally coupled to gravity. Um, so so it, it covers a quite broad class of theories. The other way that it is more powerful than it seems is that in principle, it applies to stationary and asymptotic and flat solutions as well. But you can uh, intuitively uh, easily realize that if I just take two of these stationary uh, black holes, I try to bring them together to form a binary, then I let this binary evolve. Since there is no scalar anywhere inside, there is no scalar configuration dressing up these black holes, there's not going to be any scalar interaction. There's not going to be any scalar radiation during, during that in spiral. And hence, the, 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 the radiation, the gravitational wave radiation you're going to get is going to be exactly the same as, as in general relativity. And in fact, you can also argue uh, that 
there is not enough nonlinearity in this kind of theories, even if even after field with definitions or whatever else, so that this color can get excited in the merger and potentially in the ring down. So, so it's basically telling you that in this class of theories, uh, you, you're not going to get any, any deviation even in the gravitational wave radiation in binary black holes. Uh, now, there are, that doesn't necessarily mean that there is no difference at all in general relativity. Obviously, the scalar, the scalar uh, perturbations are there. Uh, and all I just argued so far is that you can't really excite them during, during an inspiral in this class of theories. There are cases, if you do manage to find interesting physical scenarios where the scalar, uh, where the scalar field is excited, then you could potentially have detectable deviations. And in fact, it is you know, part of the power of no-hair theorems is precisely this. They, 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 they nicely summarize your assumptions so that they can go nitpick in these assumptions and find all of the interesting physical uh, scenarios. So one of them is super radiance. So if you have a rotating black hole, uh, if, if it's rotating rapidly enough, and if your scalar field is, is massive and its mass is in the right bracket uh, in reference to the, to, the, to the black hole mass, then what can happen is that your scalar field can become unstable uh, and, and a scalar cloud can grow out of it. And, that, and this, is, this is not an infinitely long-lived configuration. This is not a stable configuration, right? And this is how you actually evade the Noher theorem. This is not a stationary configuration, uh, which means eventually that cloud will have to, 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 to dissipate. But if that, uh, uh, if that process lasts long enough, it can have astrophysical significance. And also, if the way it dissipates uh, contributes, say, to gravitational wave emission, you could actually detect. And this is a very active area of research, particularly you know, considering that the scalar fields could be light, light, uh, ultra light particles, axions that could potentially you know, contribute dark matter and so on and so forth. Uh, the second, your second possibility here would actually be to uh, relax the uh, symmetry assumptions of your theorem. Uh, so the Noher theorems I mentioned assume that the whole configuration is stationary and asymptotically flat. Uh, in the case of, co I consider real, field, real scalar fields, but in the, ca in the, in the uh, case of complex scalar fields, people have shown that if you relax the symmetry assumption of the scalar and you allow it to have a time dependent phase, you can still have a stationary metric and potentially have a hairy black hole configuration. Uh, oh, sorry. Finally, the, 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 the last thing you could do is you could uh, relax the asymptotics. So you could uh, clearly black holes in the universe are not asymptotic and flat. Um, they're embedded in some cosmology. If you did take, if you did allow phi to vary at cosmological scales, you would get some, some hair and hence some back reaction and some deviation from, from the care geometry as well. This hair would be very, very strongly suppressed, right? It would basically be suppressed by the ratio of, of the characteristic time for your black hole, the light crossing time over, over the cosmological uh, time scale, right? So, so you wouldn't, that would make them entirely undetectable for large astrophysical black holes. Uh, but people are currently considering the case, uh, cases where they could be, uh, the, the time dependence could be uh, larger and, and that uh, could be non-cosmological and that could actually give you larger hair and maybe, maybe some astrophysical, have some astrophysical significance. Now, the, the other way obviously to, to, to uh, circumvent the Noher theorem is to consider a different, a different class of theories, one that is not covered at all um, by the theorem. And, Indeed, people have considered theories with um, uh, derivative interactions from the scalar field, right? Which were not covered by what I said before. Uh, it is it is known that uh, theories with derivative interaction, potentially second derivatives in the action, could actually lead to second order field equations, uh, and they have attracted a lot of attention recently. And it is known for quite a while, actually that in, in some of these cases, in, in particular, when the scalar field couples to higher order curvature invariants, uh, uh, 
that, that are hairy black holes. So this has been studied already in the 90s in the context of limits of, of, of um, uh, string theory models. And, and it was shown back then that you have an exponential coupling to the scalar field uh, to, to the gauss bonin variant, which is what I'm showing here. Uh, Kretzmann scalar minus four times Ricci square minus Ricci scalar squared, then, then that leads to black hole hair. So if you generalize basically your, your, your model uh, to contain derivative, derivative interactions and coupling to higher order curvature invariants, then you end up with a very large uh, theory space. And, and again, that opens the question, can you somehow order that theory space and find more uh, models that are more interesting than others so that you can focus on them? And again, I mean, there is an over theorem that comes to your rescue in this respect. So if you focus your attention on shift symmetric scalar fields, uh, then, then, the, then of course the, the field equation for the scalar can be written as a conservation of a current shift Symmetry uh, due to Nether's theorem uh, implies that there is a conserved current, right? And if you and, and hence you can write the equation for the scalar field in the form I've written out here. And this was exploited by by Hui and Nicolis to show that if you assume staticity and spherical symmetry, uh, asymptotic flatness, you assume that the, the norm of that current is finite in the horizon, and you restrict that current dependence on phi. In, in particular, you assume that every bit and every uh, piece of that current depends on the gradient of phi. Uh, then, then you can prove that phi equals constant is the only solution, and that again implies that black hole in this class of theory should have no hair. It, it's a very powerful theorem because it, it is very general in terms of, of the theories it applies. It applies to any shift symmetric. Theory, you expect shift symmetry to relate to, to, to whether your field has a mass. You expect massless scalars to basically be shift symmetric because the symmetry that protects you from acquiring a mass. And it can also be straightforwardly generalized to slowly rotating solutions, in fact. Uh, you, can, you can easily evade that theorem, try to evade that theorem by breaking some of its assumptions. And for instance, people have looked for. Uh, solutions where phi is time dependent and the, and the space time is still stationary and, and found those. But a particularly interesting way to kind of nitpick on the assumptions is to look at the last assumption and say, okay, what if, what if J didn't depend? Uh, what if every term contribute to the current didn't depend on the scalar field, right? And that leads you to, to precisely one potential term. Uh, it's a term I've written here. So the only way, basically, to, to write down a, a term in your Lagrangian that contributes to that current, it's shift symmetric, uh, but the contribution to the current doesn't depend on the scalar field, is that last term here, where this curly G is the gauss bonin invariant that I introduced before. And it has a linear coupling to phi. And alpha is, is, is a coupling constant. I mean, if you just inspect that action, you vary with respect to, to phi, you just get the equation below box phi plus alpha g equals zero. G contains the Kretzmann scalar, right? Uh, Kretzmann scalar doesn't generically vanish uh, in, in black hole space times, which tells you that phi can't really be zero uh, constant on a black hole space time. Black holes will actually have to have a scalar profile, uh, and hence they will have to have hair. In, in, in this theory, but at the same time, G is a total divergence. Uh, it's a topological invariant, in fact, four dimensions. So, so G, G is, is a total divergence, which means uh, up to, up to uh, boundary terms, your action and hence your field equations are shift symmetric. If you, if you shift the scalar by a constant, all you're going to get is a total divergence. Uh, now, so, so this is kind of a unique, so this is the only term in fact, in that whole class of shift symmetric scalar tensor theories that, that gives you uh, scalar hair. And that's quite interesting. In, in the small, if in the weak field limit, if you would assume that you know, phi is small, uh, has a very small amplitude, then that theory is really no different. That coupling term is really no different to the one I showed before. So it shouldn't come to a surprise that it actually leads to, to black hair. I mean, the solution, 
it's basically the solutions are similar to the ones that have been found before. But it is interesting that it, acts, it's the, it evades the theorem in that limit. And in fact, this, at the small coupling limit, if you assume that this is very weak coupling and alpha is really, really small, then, then that, at, you know, you can use field definitions to show that this is equivalent to the small field limit for phi, right? So in both of these cases, you're, you're going to get uh, what was already known. And, um, and another interesting feature of, of, of the action I've written here is that people have also shown that this linear coupling between phi and g uh, suppresses uh, somewhat the scalar field in, uh, in, in the case of neutron stars. So what happens is that neutron stars in this theory would actually have a scalar, non-trivial scalar configuration around them, just like black holes, but that, that scalar falls off faster than you expect. Instead of falling off like one over i, it falls off faster than that. There is no scalar monopole. And that is important because binary pulsar constraints uh, can be ev evaded this way. So the way you get constraints from binary pulsars is because you have, the, you assume that the two, the two uh, neutron stars are carry a scalar configuration. The two scalar monopoles basically interact. They produce dipolar emission for uh, of, of scalar, you know, for, from uh, of, the, of scalar mode, and that would change the the orbital behavior of your binary, and it would have been imprinted in in uh, in the orbital evolution of the binary that you observe, and that's how you get the constraint. If the fall off is faster than one over r, then you quench that interaction, and you don't actually get emission, so you evade the constraint. Now, that is an I, I, I need to be clear here. This is the only term that introduces here. But of course, if you started adding extra terms and interactions, you would you would change the, the shape of that scalar configuration that you have, right? So it is it is kind of the leading order effect coming from that term, potentially modulated by any other terms um, you can have. But since it is special and since, since it is also kind of the weak field or weak coupling limit of the exponential coupling that I showed before, which is not shift symmetric. Uh, it's interesting to, to, to use it to try to understand what these black holes look like. And the, the easiest thing you could do is to just try to find a solution which is close to Schwarzschild. It, it is continuously connected to Schwarzschild if you were to take that coupling constant to zero and you go back to GR in a minimally coupled scalar field. And, and you could look for that solution, in fact, perturbatively in the coupling constant. So you can assume that this metric is Schwarzschild. You can uh, try to solve for the scalar in that Schwarzschild background to leading order in the coupling constant and, and obtain a profile. Uh, and if you do that, you get that profile that I've written here. Prime here is the derivative with respect to the, to the radius. And and as you can see, what I've written here uh, would mean that the scalar is singular at the horizon when I go to r equals to m. I mean, it's Schwarzschild background, right? Now, if I if I want to avoid that singular, or of course, c here is is an integration constant that I got out of integrating uh, uh, the, the scalar equation, and and it's a free parameter basically of the, for the solution here. So I could try to avoid that singularity in the horizon by tuning that parameter C. And indeed, if C is 2 over M, then, then the, the scalar profile becomes regular, and its derivative is given by this formula here. So it depends now only on the mass and, and uh, the coupling constant, which is considered fixed for any given theory. And hence, if I, if I were to go, and I could use this to go and read off the scalar charge, basically the coefficient of the 1 over R fall of, of, of the scalar, which we like measure asymptotically. And it turns out to, to be 2a over m. But the important part here is it's completely fixed with respect to the mass due to my regularity condition. So the lesson you learn already just by studying that kind of this uh, perturbative limit in the coupling is that the, the, there isn't any independent charge. There is, you know, the, 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 Every, for every given mass of your black hole, you have precisely one scalar configuration, basically, right? So you have hair. Some people call this hair of the second kind. Now, the, this tuning that I've, that I've made to avoid the, the, the singularity is not something unphysical. Obviously, you wouldn't form that uh, uh, singular 
configuration from, from evolution. Evolution would always prefer the regular configuration. And you can verify that by, by doing, say, numerical scalar collapse on, 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 on a black hole or a collapsing star. And, and, uh, and uh, you do indeed get the configuration I just said as the endpoint of the numerical evolution. Now, the second, the second uh, point to keep uh, from this is that if you go beyond working perturbatively in the coupling and you just go and find your uh, non-perturbative spherically symmetric black hole solution uh, and try to study its properties, what you see is that it has a singularity that is sitting at the finite radius, or the finite radial coordinate. So it's basically a, a, an area singularity. And as you, um, as you crank down uh, the mass of the black hole or, the, or you crank up the value of, of the coupling constant, uh, then that singularity starts moving closer and closer to the horizon of your black hole. And if you, if you overdo it, eventually it will hit the horizon of the black hole. And instead of having a black hole, you're going to have a naked singularity, which basically means that for a fixed value of the coupling, you have a minimum mass for your black hole. If you try to go below that minimum mass, basically you don't have black holes. You only have um, uh, naked singularities. So, so that's, uh, that's the opposite in, in, in this respect. I mean, in, in my view, basically, that really tells you that beyond that point, you shouldn't really be trusting that theory to, to describe black holes classically. Now, clearly, there is something interesting coming, uh, coming out of, from coupling scalar fields to the gauss bonnet invariant. So I'd like to, to push a little bit further in this direction. I, I, I looked at the linear and the exponential cases a little bit of the uh, uh, for the coupling of the scalar to the gauss bonnet invariant, I'm going to take basically exactly the same theory and allow the function to be a general function, phi. And now I'm going to impose a condition. I'm going to impose that this function of phi uh, has a derivative that, va that vanishes for some constant value of phi. Right? So, so if, if you look at the corresponding equation for phi that I've written down here, it, if my if if for some phi equals constant f prime vanishes, then that makes that an admissible solution to the scalar equation, right? So my, the condition I'm imposing, it just tells you phi equals constant, just guarantees that phi equals constant for some constant phi zero is an admissible solution. Now, if, if phi is constant, then it turns out that if, if you, if you uh, substitute that in the equations for the metric as well, you'll just go back to GR, right? So I'm there basically imposing that F is such that it allows GR solutions to be admissible uh, for my theory. Well, if you make that assumption, then you can prove that provided that second condition holds here, that inequality that I've written, these solutions are actually unique. Pro, uh, for, uh, provide their stationary and asymptotically flat. So this is really a no hair theorem, like the one I, I, I proved before, that says for a theory that admits GR black hole solutions that are stationary and asymptotically flat, then these solutions are unique, provided that inequality holds. Now, let me take you back to one of my earlier slides, this one here. So, the inequality to have that no her theorem uh, in this slide, I, I tell it exactly as having a positive effective, effective mass, square effective mass for my perturbation, right? Uh, this inequality here is exactly the same. So satisfying that inequality, having the left-hand side being negative, actually means if you just perturb that equation here in a flat path, means that your effective mass square for the scalar remains positive. So in both cases, all that this means is that you don't really have a tachyonic instability, that your scalar field doesn't need to grow just, just in its own right because it has a negative effective mass square, right? So the, the interesting thing is, what happens if you don't satisfy that inequality, right? So uh, it, it turns out that if you, if you do construct your theory in such a way that it does acquire a negative effective mass square 
in, in a black hole background, somewhere in the exterior of a black hole background, you can evade that Noher theory that's just talked about, and the scalar field will want to grow. So this is not actually uh, new in, in the context of compact objects, right? So there's, uh, back in the 90s, the Moore and Esposito Farese proposed um, a phenomenon called scalarization in the context of just standard scalar tensor theories by which the scalar field acquires uh, an effective mass through the coupling to gravity. That effective mass is uh, positive for, for low curvature, low stars of low compactness, basically. Right. What you see here is, is basically that effective uh, uh, mass or effective potential at the center of the star of a star where the uh, curvature is uh, in compactness are highest. So for low compactnesses, basically the effective mass of the scalar is, is positive and the scalar is trapped to that constant value that gives you a GR configuration. As you start cranking up the compactness of the star, uh, the, eventually the potential changes shape. It acquires this Mexican hat shape. Your scalar field acquires a negative effective mass and it, ro it rolls down the potential and it prefers to go to a non trivial configuration. And th that, since this is a threshold effect, that, that was called scalarization. And it gives you fairly large effects already once you cross the threshold. Now, that model of scalarization only, uh, only worked for, for um, neutron stars, not for black holes. It, it, because it relied to a cup, uh, 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 on a coupling between the scalar and the uh, Ricci scalar, which vanishes in black hole space times in GR as they are Ricci flat. What I'm describing here is, is effectively the same effect, but, but uh, taking place for black holes. So, as I said, this left hand side of the inequality, or minus that left hand side, is basically the effective mass square of the scalar field. It is controlled by the second derivative of the scalar, but also by the gauss bonnet invariant. So that gauss bonnet invariant, I've, I've written it down here for a Kerr black hole. Chi is the usual spin parameter A times cos theta as a shorthand notation. And for Schwarzschild, chi is zero. And the gauss bonnet invariant for Schwarzschild is, it turns out to be sign, sign definite. So throughout the exterior of a Schwarzschild black hole, it is positive, which means if I just construct my theory in such a way that F double prime is, is, uh, is positive as well, I'm violating my condition. The scalar will acquire tachyonic, uh, will acquire a negative effective mass somewhere uh, outside, somewhere outside. Now, I mean, one caveat here is I'm in curved space time. Right. In, in fact, in curved space time, I can actually have a little bit of a negative effective mass without being unstable. So, so G now controls how large that effective mass is, which means as, 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 I, as I make the mass of the black hole smaller, G becomes larger, the, that, that, that absolute value of the negative effective mass becomes larger as well. And eventually, I cross the threshold and my scalar field becomes tachyonically unstable and it wants to grow. Um, and the easiest model you could, of course, uh, come up with that is if f is uh, uh, f uh, is just phi squared. It has around phi phi equal zero. It has a vanished first derivative, right? And if you choose the sign of the coupling constant, right, you satisfy the condition that f double prime, which is a constant, is positive. And for sufficiently small black holes. The scalar will become unstable, and you will suddenly scalarize. Now, if I if I now go from Schwarzschild to Kerr, k is non-zero. G, no, G is no longer sign definite, and in fact, it can change sign sign near the horizon. So now I can have a a, a, a similar interesting effect, which is that. If I now choose my f double prime to be negative instead of positive, and, and hence my Schwarzschild solution is always stable for any value of the mass in, 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 in this kind of model, what I can do is, since g changes sign, I can start cranking up the spin, and g can become sufficiently negative close to the horizon uh, because in a, of a rapidly spinning black hole, and that could actually uh, endow the scalar field with a negative effective mass. It can trigger the tachyonic instability, and this, again, the scalar field will want to grow. 
right? And, and hence, in, in, in this type of models, it will be only rapidly spinning black holes, irrespective of their mass, that will have hair. Um, and indeed, people have found, have also looked at the non perturbative aspects of this and found uh, the corresponding hairy solution. So what I'm really describing here is a mechanism by which, unlike GR, where all black holes are basically self-similar, right? And, and uh, you have a situation where black holes can acquire different characteristics from GR once you cross a threshold in mass or in spin, depending on how you construct your model. The, the, basically, the, the effect can be understood perturbatively at the onset of this effect can be understood perturbatively uh, as a tachyonic instability, right? Uh, which is later quenched by nonlinear corrections, and you end up with a stable configuration. So the onset of the effect, which is perturbative, uh, for the onset of the effect, you can basically write down quite easily the most general set of terms that would contribute to it, right? Uh, because it's only the terms that would contribute to linearized theory around the curved, curved background. So I've written all of the terms here, and, and there is the issue, as, I, as, as I've mentioned earlier, for the no hair theorems so of field redefinitions. Basically, you could actually perform field redefinitions. So these are the most general terms. You, you can show that these are the most general terms up to field redefinitions of the metric and the scalar, right? Um, so what you've got here is the, the bare mass, obviously, of the scalar, which, unless you are willing to make the bare mass square negative, it's not going to do much for you. The, the, the two key contributions are the coupling to the Ritzy scalar and to the gauss one invariant, which can contribute to the effective mass around the curve background. And you get an extra contribution to the kinetic term, which can't really, doesn't, can't really uh, on its own generate, obviously, an effective mass for the scalar. But once you have the other terms, it could just change its, change its value. That part of the, in the kinetic uh, term you could do away with some conform, some disformal transformation of the metric, right? You can trade it off to some disformal transformation of the metric. Where, and, and that bit here, the coupling with the Ricci scalar, is what I referred to before as the, as the Damures post of Areza model in the linearized limit. So, so uh, people might be unfamiliar with this formulation. Uh, now, so, so basically, and these Thomas? are the. Yep. Uh, you have like two minutes plus question. So okay, I'm I'm going to wrap it up. Thanks. Yeah. So so this is the most general kind of sets of terms that will trigger the instability and hence control its threshold. Um, but but as I said before, the way it works is that there is a but you can supplement this action with any sort of non-linear terms uh, that that you want, and it is these terms that are going to eventually quench that instability control the endpoint of that instability and determine the properties of scalarized uh, black holes. And you can use that to, to, to construct uh, models of scalarization by, by considering different types of nonlinear interactions for your scalar. That could be interactions of the scalar with itself, like a phi to the fourth interaction. It could be the inherent nonlinearity in the couplings that I showed. So in specific, these terms, for instance, could could, uh, through back reaction, control the, the endpoint uh, and the properties of your black holes, right? Or it could be extra uh, couplings that you add between curvature and the scalar. Uh, so since I'm, I'm running out of time, I'm just going to uh, describe here the, the mechanism one last time, and then I'm going to go to my conclusions. So, so basically, what I'm trying to say is, in general, the basic principle is that you have a linear instability, which can be described by this equation, which is controlled by, by some nonlinear effects. This is a mechanism. You can see actually that as a mechanism of screening physics at low curvatures, new physics at low curvatures. Because if you, if you view it the other way around, what you do have is at high curvatures, you have deviations from GR. As you crank down the curvature, basically, uh, you, you, the, the your scalar field now prefers to just go to that trivial configuration where you just recover exactly what you have in GR. So that's, that you can also see this scalarization in reverse as a mechanism that screens new physics at low curvature and explains why we haven't actually seen 
scalar fields of this type anywhere in weak field observations. Um, the instability, I mean, I, 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 uh, uh, here I talked about the scalar and I also talked about uh, a tachyonic instability as what is triggering the scalar to go in the strong field regime. But people have gotten creative about, about this. They have considered other types of instability that are then again nonlinear linear instabilities that are nonlinear quens. They are also con people are trying to generalize this mechanism to other fields, vector fields, potentially tensor fields, right? Under the guise of vectorization or tensorization. Okay, so without I'm going to try to wrap up. So uh, I, I hope I convince you that no her theorems. Uh, can actually be used to pin down some interesting uh, theories from a strong gravity perspective. Uh, further, I mean, I focused here mostly on, on, on um, uh, uh, real fields and, and to a large part on ma uh, massless fields. I mean, there is still room for improvement for massive and complex scalar fields uh, on the non no her theorem side. Uh, I also um, introduced like, the concept of, of, of uh, scalarization for black holes, right? I inspired by the neutron scalar scalarization by Damour and Esposto Fareze. I think, I think this sort of short strong field phase transition is a very elegant way to explain potentially why new physics could appear in high curvatures, even though we haven't actually seen it in the, in the, in the weak field regime, or, or conversely, why uh, new physics has actually been screened in the weak field regime. Uh, so I do think that these models are, are inherently interesting now that we're probing a strong field regime. Of course, they come, the theories that I talked about, I mean, they come with some baggage and the two are the most obvious ones. One is, are these, can, can you argue that these are actually EFTs of some interesting fundamental theory? And this is something that we need to keep um, exploring and, and try to relate them to fundamental theories. And the second is, as, as EFTs, since we're talking here about the strong field regime, do they actually have a sensible nonlinear evolution? I mean, what, I think one of the um, lessons to take home here is that the nice, the theories with which are nice kind of obvious uh, uh, theories quadratic in the first derivatives of your fields and, all, and so on and so forth, actually tend to be covered by no her theorems and they don't really give you any deviation. It's the ones with the more cumbersome structure with curvature couplings and uh, you know, uh, derivative interactions and so on and so forth that actually manage to produce significant deviations. And these are much harder to formulate as, a, as a, an initial value problem. And there's plenty of work being done in this now in trying to, to, to set up initial value problems for this theory simulate binaries in, in this context. So I'm going to stop here and take questions. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Thomas. So yeah, indeed, uh, I think we, now we have time just for one question. We can have more discussion uh, later. Uh, so there is one question from uh, Che Yuchen. Please, Che, you can speak. Yes, thank you for, for the nice talk. Uh, I just have a cu I'm curious about, so is anyone considered the scalarization induced by a Pontryagin scalar? Sorry, I, I, I couldn't hear the last part. Can you say it again? Uh, is anyone consider the uh, the scalarization induced by Pontryagin scalar, the the R, R star coupling? Oh, you mean for the Pontryagin uh, invariant? Yeah, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 there is a paper that has con con considered this. Uh, I mean, the, the, there is a caveat because I mean, usually if, if you try to do uh, so the question is about basically the um, uh, dynamical Chern Simon theory, where there is a pseudo scalar in, in the, normally that covers the Pondriang density. And this is a way to, to get parity violations in the gravity sector, right? And, and th the point is, in generally, if you want your, your, your action to be parity invariant and yet get parity violations, uh, the, 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 this is a pseudo scalar, in fact, and not a scalar. And in that case, you can actually get scalarization going. What, what people have done is, is relax that condition, start from what is a manifestly parity invariant action, basically, and try to construct the scalarization model. And I'm not sure how much attention that has received, but there are, there are a couple of papers on this. OK, thank you. Maybe just one quick question from Shinji. Hi, Thomas. Hi, Shinji. Very nice talk. So Thanks. I have a question about uh, uh, this uh, uh, binary parser constraint. 
you mentioned that uh, the hair is uh, short. That that's the reason why you can evade. Yeah. And uh, but uh, so in, did did you consider time dependence of the system or or just the static configuration? Uh, so so yeah. first to clarify what uh, this comment applied to this model, right? The linear coupling. Yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't apply to the scalarization models. The, the, scal mm -hmm. the, 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 the scalarization models, once you have the hair, the hair is have a one over r for off, not a one over r squared. I see. But in the scalarization models, you can have theories where it's black holes are scalarized and neutron stars are not scalarized, and then you can evade mm -hmm. the constraints in this way. Now, I now see. for the for for uh sorry, for this theory here, uh I mean in principle. If you assume that there is external asymptotics which are time dependent, then you might have some radiation, right? Yeah. And, 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 and the amount of radiation would depend basically on the ambient scalar field you're putting in based on this, this uh, asymptotics, right? If, if you assume that, uh, that all of the scalar field is generated by, by, by the, the pulsars, then, then you won't get radiation because basically the fall off is too fast, right? I mean, you eventually will if they come close enough, right? It's a, it's suppression. It's not it's not that you don't get it, but for the separations, it's negligible basically. I mean, that this is what has been argued by the people that have looked into. Okay, it. I see. Even I mean, the, I thought that uh, this uh, each neutron star can be it, it, in a sense a source of scalar field, and it is moving. <laughs> so I thought that. Uh, Scare field may be you know, that, 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 you're perfectly right. I mean, that, yeah. of course, but what my point is, if you don't have a scalar monopole, right, which is what the argument is in mm -hmm. that paper by, by Yagi, Stein, and, and, and oh. Yunus, basically you don't have dipolar emission because you don't have monopoles. You, you have higher, yeah. higher multiple emission, which comes at a higher order in PN theory, and, mm -hmm. and hence it is smaller okay. and suppressed, right? I see. I see. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much uh, to Thomas again. So we can have more discussion later for sure. Sure. So we can move.